all right welcome back to the live stream everyone a little bit earlier today uh, because it's uh not super hot and also uh, i wanted to finish um slightly earlier than normal so that i can um go do a few other things later in the day all right so um i did tweet about this value acceptance in crude oil let me just flick to the larger screen so if you um are following me on twitter i said that i was going into a late value acceptance trade that i didn't quite catch in time so um didn't like my entry there and uh, it seems to be slowing down which is not unusual for this time of day uh, the value acceptance trade is something that happens when the market opens above the previous day's distribution curve then goes back to it goes inside it and then we're basically accept expecting the market to rotate to the other side you know, the other side of that distribution curve aka the value area is all the way down here at 1928 and we might get there but i just don't like it when the market starts slowing down for this part of the session because there is um, a very high probability of the market reversing for this time of day so obviously if i'm not in enough profit i don't quite have enough space to kind of sit in a trade and wait endlessly because this is intraday trading we do have the time constraint which complicates things so you have to be pretty spot on with your entries and whenever i'm late into the entry i'm always a little bit more risk averse um, when the market doesn't move immediately away from my trading location all right let's see who's in the house ah oh, we've got uh we've got um I'm, i've been basically a triplet with brian and jeremy today when it comes to our trading all three of us went into <laughs> the value acceptance on gold so when i posted it on twitter brian and jeremy both went oh my god i'm in that oh my god i'm in that too um i think brian took took one r out of it so well done on that uh, but now I'm actually thinking if this starts to turn around, I might want to kick off the trade in the opposite direction. But obviously for that, we first need the price to tell me that that is what's going to happen. One extenuating circumstance about this whole story here is that I now have kind of a semblance of sustained auction, which means the move outside of that first hour trading range, which is what we use to, um, as a reference for whether the move is successful or not, is now definitely sitting below that initial balance, uh, which is the first hour trading range. So in order for me to get involved here, I need this to drop a little bit more and then maybe to reverse because at the moment if i was going to run a trade like i normally run it on my stop loss for that particular setup in the opposite direction i don't have enough profit margin like i maybe have one r so not it's not not quite good enough for me so i'm gonna sit out and wait and see what happens there um let's have a look at crude oil because crude oil i'm also running a, a little trade there which is a bit risky because we haven't had the break of that first hour trading range yet uh, but we do have some levels which are quite interesting and high probability reversal points in crude oil uh, one being the 0 0.5 dr which is like a fixed average range using the gmt midnight open and then you effectively get ever average true range or average daily range number you put half of it above the open and half of it below the open and that becomes your reference point for any reversals um during the summertime this can become a good benchmark in crude oil for uh for any trades where you kind of want to um still do trading in a very slow market but you don't want to um to run like momentum trades because that is an that is not a good strategy for crude oil um Jul june and july are months when things really slow down for crude oil not so much on gold gold is um remarkably one of the products that keeps moving throughout the year it doesn't really have too much seasonality attached to it 
but crude oil in particular even now like if i bring this window up a little bit higher and if i just try and grab this so i don't know how much you can see uh when um uh, when we have these these um numbers here from the blotech dr so if you um uh, Brian, I'll get to your question in a minute. Uh, so if you have a look at the session range itself, it's 172. But if I use the blood tech back test mode, then I kind of keep going back. So, I mean, this is a 30 minute chart, but let's go back just a few days prior. We are looking at 210 ticks for the entire session. So that's already a pretty significant decrease of liquidity. Um, average daily, average session ranges are all... Um, effectively measures of volatility and yes they can be used for a reversal area as well but more to the point i use it in many ways not just in one way so i want to see how it how the price behaves around those levels when it was reached so all of that tells you quite a lot of information about the type of a day and the strategy that we're supposed to be applying. So let me switch off the broad tech backtest mode. Um, so Brian, if you had a really good entry, if you kind of caught it um, at the beginning, so let me increase this. So this orange rectangle, that's the, um, the value area. I'm putting it here um, because I can see it a bit better on these dark charts, which look really nice visually, but I'm kind of struggling to see. First of all, I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> Second of all, the lights are really bright. So the dark uh, backgrounds are very sexy looking, right? I like that. But as a result, me being in my 40s, <laughs> I don't really see as well as I used to see. So, uh, so I basically uh, just put this orange rectangle to give me an idea of where exactly are we with the value area. So Brian, if you caught it all the way up here, so if your trade looked something like this, um, I would have kept that because that is actually a pretty good entrance um, into the value acceptance and you have time, you know, you, you would have had, you know, 50 ticks to decide whether or not you want to keep it. Um, this is also why it's um, it's kind of handy to have a mentor who can who can sort of guide you through the process because there are just little things, little finesse things that you can do in order to maximize your chances of a trade working out. Um, and uh, if you don't have anyone to guide the process, obviously you have to guide it yourself. But then you have to have a lot of experience. So it's a chicken or an egg situation. Which one is better to get there by yourself, spending a lot of time doing it, which is what I did. Like it took me probably uh, about nine years to get proper consistency. I was making money throughout it, but you know, I was far from consistent. And uh, we did have risk managers who sort of held our hands for, for a lot of the trades, but they never really went into, into like proper performance coaching. They just kind of uh, skimmed over your profits and losses and they were just like, oh, profit margin, hit rate, blah. And that was pretty much it. Um, it was only much later that we started having um, having services that where you can actually work with someone who can look at your individual type of trades and entries and how you've actually positioned yourself on that particular trade and then take that um, into consideration when discussing whether to keep a trade intraday or not. But yeah, for me, because I didn't have uh, that kind of an entry, you guys know that I rarely sit in front of the computers before posting my cards anyways. Uh, as it happened today, I was watching this, but I was doing something else and I didn't manage to, to get anywhere near that. And in fact, I think my entry was um, 1935 1935.2. So, you know, there's not much room. It's like, sure, I still had about 65 ticks before I hit the value acceptance target, which is a setup that I was in on. You always have to quantify your entries and targets rather than just going, oh, let me see where it ends up. That's a terrible way to trade, especially in today. Because, uh, again, you don't have that time to, uh, to kind of keep trades forever and ever. Lucas is here. Lucas, hello. Lucas is our new Silver Plus member. So he's just going through level two, I believe. And um, 
Yeah, so now, Lucas, all of the stuff that I'm talking about, which may seem uh, quite complex for anyone who's coming to the channel for the first time, and me kind of yapping on about the first hour trading range and post the record and David Trail is like, well, what? <laughs> but if you um, if you go through the program, that it all kind of that meta language becomes uh, much more understandable, and you suddenly start seeing things with entirely brand new eyes. Uh, I know that um, any sort of market profile and order flow concepts were very, very transformative for me. Um, I struggled for about a year by myself uh, to go from swing trading to day trading. And this was in 2013. So I, I had already been trading for like five, six years. Um, so I wasn't new. I was actually, I took my initial account from 2K up to 250K. And that's like in the space of like those two to three years, maybe like the first couple of years were pretty slow. I was making money, but I only started with 2K and um, and then things really started uh, heating up. But it still wasn't, you know, it wasn't millions. It was just um, me doing pretty well, which is why I thought, hey, maybe I should go into prop trading. Um, but it wasn't really until I got to the prop firm uh, in Chicago that they actually taught me market profile, order flow, and then I started combining all of that with the stuff that I was already doing. So in like immediately once you work things out, everything tends to happen pretty quickly. So that's why um, trading definitely can be rewarding at one point. It's just you have to, um, you know, go the whole whole hog to, to effectively stay the course and um, not give up um analyze levels incorporate data science data analytics into your trading and all of that oh no somebody's throwing up again i've got three dogs here who is that god what is wrong with bernard man this is like like the second week if you notice guys like last time bernard was in here he also threw up it's like what's up with, with you dude bernie Sorry, boy. Sorry, Benjamin. Huh? <laughs> you okay? <laughs> Feeling better now or worse? I don't know. Bernard is allergic to chicken, by the way. So uh, some of the others eat chicken, but sometimes Bernard is a little bit. Uh, uh, a bit hungry because <laughs> he's massive and uh, he actually wants other people's food and then he gets in trouble okay come here come here come on nah. oh god you're so massive oh my god this is the biggest problem he in the world <laughs> okay here we go throw you up you boy Can you just sit next to me, please? Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay. You all good? Yeah? I think he feels better. <laughs> For anyone who's new here, I have eight dogs. Uh, this is one of them. He is the biggest boy. He's a half Pomeranian, half uh, King Charles Cavalier, so he shouldn't be this massive. But there is such a thing called throwback genes, so... He is more the size of a Labrador <laughs> than, um, than Cavalier and Pomeranian. But well, there we go. What do you think of my trade? Should I have kept it, Bernie? Should I have kept the trade? Well, what do you think? I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's have a look at crude oil whilst Bernard is standing up for no reason whatsoever. Right, so uh, my crude oil uh, trade idea here is a risky uh, strength from inside the initial balance. Why is it risky? Because we still have that first hour of the trading range that has not been broken. So at this point, I'm just guessing because of an inside day. So we opened up inside yesterday's distribution curve, which means we haven't moved to any new levels. 
um, that means that the trend is not really the momentum is not really there the trend is not really there so uh, the the fake outs and price staying inside an already established range that happens during the first hour of trading can just stay there so a couple of uh, things to note is that here we have that 0 0.5 DR line uh, which I know is pretty reactive in crude oil it is one of the high probability levels and um, yeah so I'm basically looking for the market to move to the high of the day which also has a round number of 70 and we'll see whether that has any merit but it is risky because I usually like to trade once the first hour of trading range is already uh, broken and that kind of tends to bring a lot more bounce a lot more market participants and the moves that you're looking for become faster and easier to obtain uh, when it's uh, effectively a non-trend day which is what this is uh, you have slower price action everything is um, muted and uh, not unusual for summertime but at the same time crude oil doesn't really have that many non-trend days so i can't expect this to maybe pick up at some point today um crude oil yeah i mean after settlement uh usually crude oil tends to slow down quite a bit but we do have a few hours before that happens so we have about three and a half hours now so that there is still time there's still time so we'll see whether this um, this has merit if we don't move uh, pretty soon i am gonna bail and then maybe try again so we don't want to sit in trades that are just not going anywhere um, um with a glimmer of hope that they may end up in profit at some point of the day because that is not the name of the game we need to try and be accurate to within about 40 ticks of your zone of interest and i look at every single level as a, as a zone not as a single price point so that's something that uh, you can adopt so rather than saying oh 0.5 r here um 0.5 dr and that is the only area that i want to get involved in you can actually say well this is my 0.5 r but really, I'm kind of looking at this whole area for my reversal and entry into this trade. Another thing that's happened here is that um, if I show you where the value area from Friday is, that's here. While we opened inside it, the market did try and go above it which means that it kind of attempted to reject the value area which also adds to uh, the bullish sentiment potential so it's not just that i have one level there are multiple things happening here today which is why i'm choosing to take the long side of the trade there's also this h4q low that uh, you can see here better that's my concept um kind of similar to supply and demand but it's it's more to do with a chart location of, of how low is low enough or how high is high enough for the market participants to take note. Um, so rather than having like super detailed areas on large time frames, I use my Q points, you know, quarter, quarter points, quarter, quartile points, whatever you want to call them, um, as kind of an additional zones of interest where I expect some sort of a reaction to happen. Now, obviously, if there is no reaction, then I'm not going to trade against it. I'm just going to trade uh, with uh, more the intraday side of things. Uh, summertime is June to August. Yes, that's right. Oh, Lucas says <laughs> he was here last three to four streams. Yeah, you need to you need to uh, you need to say something because obviously I can see people watching and stuff. But until you actually say hello, how are you doing? I don't know whether you guys are on the stream or not. And uh, for those of you who are with me nearly every single day on this live stream, I know your names and you're on Twitter. You're usually on the program as well. So it's, uh, yeah, there we go. So Mike is here as well. That's cool. Yeah, so Jeremy, um, June can, you know, as you've noticed, June was still pretty lively, but the real slowdown, especially in crude oil, tends to happen for the second part of July. Like you, you're literally looking at a market that, that is 
pretty much flat. And that is the time to use more of the, um, the ranging strategies. Like for example, you can uh, try and stay away from VWAP and things like that. Maybe use it as a target and just expect the price to keep bouncing um, inside an already established range. And that tends to work really well for about a month. And then we get to the end of August, um, things tend to pick up uh, towards the end of August. Sometimes on some years you do have the slower slowness of the markets uh, carrying into September as well. But since COVID, that hasn't really been the case. I think there's, there's a lot more people, um, a lot more people who are trading now, even though they're small traders, independent traders, but they are still, um, they're still active. So all of them add on to all of the transactions that happen, which in turn increases liquidity that we have. That's also the reason for lunchtime hour um, activities. Now you see that in ES and in equities. Uh, before equities during lunchtime, it was like a non-event. You could just go and do something for an hour and nothing would change. <laughs> nothing. But now I can't even walk the dogs during that time because there's so many things happening. So I don't trade equities very often. I, as you guys know, my core markets are crude oil and gold. I do tend to trade equities uh, towards the end of the session, sometimes some parts of the year, but I'm not an equities person. So if that's what you're looking for, just go elsewhere. <laughs> I'm not your person. Yes, Mike. So SIEB is risky because the initial balance has not been extended yet. Uh, having said that, it is an inside day. So that's why I'm kind of banking on this not really going too far um, and just kind of going with this uh, rejection of the value area that we had earlier in the session. Um, in fact, it's kind of started moving a bit. So let's see if we can actually make some money today. Because right now I'm scratched because I bailed at scratch. So it's literally just commissions. <laughs> We're going to see how this works out. Let's uh, let's go through the time frames. It's something that I like to do um, to keep an eye on everything. It's kind of a technique that I've adapted from fighter pilots uh, because let's face it, all of us are always in a disadvantaged position whenever we are uh, doing something like this. Um, this is a, an unknown, an uncertainty um, is non-existent. So we are in an environment of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns. So the only thing that we can do is to follow our own rules. So in a chaotic environment, rules become very important. Now markets are far from random. They actually have pretty strong mechanics uh, to them. And if you start to understand uh, some of those relationships, which again, I've explained in the program, um, everything becomes a lot less mystical, you know, suddenly you're not using a crystal ball and you're not just going, well, I think it's going to go this way. Instead, you start to use data science and data analytics uh, to make a, in, decisions that are a lot more informed. So that's probably a, one of the ways to, to put it. This is why today I'm using the open sentiment to say that actually this will be the range for the day. Maybe we might extend it, you know, in an hour or so. Um, but generally it's, uh, right. So um, Mike is asking, was Weeb also an option? No, Weeb wasn't an option because Mike, if you see, Weeb would have had to have created the, the supply during the initial balance. But um, what you see here is during A and B, we only have the bullish engulfing, which creates something that I call the conterminous line, which you know, Mike. Um, and that defines your direction for SIEB or WEEB. Those are my setups. Uh, it's basically like a blend between market profile and supply and demand concepts. Um, you won't find SIEB and WEEB in other <laughs> places because I'm the one who, uh, who conceptualized those. Uh, so the only place where you will find them is in level two of the pro development program. Um, but yeah, that's basically uh, one of the, the reasons why we would look at longs here and why I am in this long. Uh, but obviously open sentiment, larger time frame narrative and chart location all comes into it. Um, it sounds very complicated when I start explaining it to somebody who's coming from maybe a more simplistic 
uh, way of doing things, but it's, it's really all just to support that informed decision making using market generated information. It's nothing more, right? We just use statistics and observable events that we've quantified over the last several years. Um, I'm also a programmer, so I use very simple uh, tests, statistical tests. Uh, they're, they're not like sometimes they're not full on algorithms. It's just literally a test of a level. So just seeing how many times the price reversed from a particular level. Obviously, if you can do programming and something like R, um, that becomes much easier because you don't have to do it manually. However, this is why we created the Blatic back test mode where when you start going back and if I also switch on all of the um, levels from the supply and demand, these are the boxes. Then you have the average daily ranges that are dynamic. Some of them might dynamic, one of them isn't. <laughs> um, and then you have the market profile TPO. Um, so immediately, as soon as you start clicking backwards, um, the, uh, the R indicator Blatic MP will change the sessions automatically. And even if you're not into programming and you, you have no idea how to do that, you can just go back, like simply just going back and looking how the levels reacted. So for example, let's take the average session range, which is my adaptation of average daily range. So we only use the session averages. So let's see if we can find how many times the price may have hit it. So here we have the Tokyo session. You can see this blue line that turns into a dotted line when the market has exhausted it, in, for the lack of a better word. And you can see that the price goes down from it. Now this, this was the way the market looked at the time. So first exhaustion is here, but you always look for reversal price action before acting in my methodology at the very least. So we're not psychic, we're not trying to be mystic mag or anything like that. We are just literally looking at a relevant price action event around the level of interest and then playing that. Much simpler than pretending you're psychic, yeah? So for example, here we have a little bearish engulfing for Asia and then down we go. Then London turns up. We never get close to the average session ranges, so nothing happens there. But let's see if we can find another area. So keep going, keep going. Okay, so here's London. Now, by the time that this starts happening, um, you can see that the market sort of slows down, but ultimately ignores the price. So that's not what you want. You want an actual reversal that goes back through the level that you're looking for. So here, if the market had gone above this level, which is the average session low, I would have considered getting involved, but it just ignored it. So we leave it alone, right? So market generated information, very, very important. And then uh, for the New York session, here we go. So it falls and the average, let me just remove this trade level here. The average session range is down here. And um, it gets smashed, then the price reverses, then tests it again, at which point you have a, a chance to enter, and that's your little scalp. So that's the only way that I would scalp, but my scalps are usually like, you know, 30 to 50 ticks and not two to four, because I don't really scalp. So there is definitely smaller opportunities. You can't control how long uh, the, the move goes on for or when it's going to happen. What you can control is how you will choose to take advantage of it. Okay. And that's where the knowledge and experience has to come in. I can teach you the levels, but you have to sit there and trade and actually see how these levels actually behave in real time. Right? So, um, Jer oh, Jerobi has joined us. Okay. So, um, Jerobi, I decided to do this a little bit earlier today, uh, cause I have things to do later on. So rather than avoiding the live stream altogether, I decided to do it slightly earlier. Um, I will also say during July, I am going to uh, reduce the daily live streams to one or two per week. I haven't really decided just yet because I want to, uh, do some other things and obviously being here on the live stream for 90 minutes every day uh, does take out a lot of my time. 
Um, if you're hearing noise, by the way, if this microphone starts picking up noise, I do have some, um, some builders in, so they're doing the room next door. So don't get, uh, I mean, my, my guys, you guys are already used to the drilling, <laughs> the lovely soundtrack that I occasionally have here. Um, so yeah, uh, I am probably going to reduce July live streams to either one or two live streams per week rather than four. Um, and then come August, that's probably going to go down even further. So just be aware that if I'm not doing anything on Monday and Tuesday, you know why, because it is the summer. I like to um, take advantage of my summertime. So that means a reduction in some live streams and in trading as well, because I typically don't really trade as frequently during the summer. So I certainly won't be looking for four or five trades a day. But yeah, um, so that's that's kind of the gist of how you can do uh, any kind of test of the level manually. Obviously, you need some kind of a way to go back in time. I know that many of these platforms offer playbacks, which is great. It's it's um, it's very useful, but I never really find that they offer playbacks with your desired uh, indicators. I was always a little bit extra, so this is probably why I ended up having a technology company. And I always needed stuff that just wasn't on the market. It just, you know, you couldn't really find anything um, that would suit my needs as a trader. So that's why I resorted to a lot of Excel spreadsheets. This was before I learned how to code. But even now, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm the best coder in the world. I'm highly functional, but not like every time I, I need something that actually plots things and displays some kind of information graphically, I would much rather have my team do it because they are like superstars with what they're doing. And um, yeah. I basically know my place in the world. <laughs> I can do trading, I can do strategies, but um, there is a point where I will delegate because my knowledge is nowhere near their knowledge. All right, so uh, let's have a look at what's going on with gold now because I can see that that's kind of moving as well. Let's remove this thing, expand. Get the view app on here too. Right, so this is now one of those um, one of those times when post and why cut, which is what the time zone we are we, we are in now. Um, there is something called the Forex option expiry that happens every single day. Gold is a Forex linked instrument, so that's why it has this knock on effect and behavior. Um, and usually this is the reason why I say to people, be very careful with continuation trades during this part of the session, because this sort of thing can happen. Uh, today, I don't have a level that I can use here to fade this, which is why I'm staying out of this. Um, Maybe if the market climbs back up to this area, I would be interested in a short. So I want to be a seller there. I'm going to see whether that can happen maybe in the last hour or two of the session. Mike, yes, I uh, I backtested the Blattec DR. Yes, that, that one also tracks. So if you, the only thing that doesn't track is the UAP because that's just a single measure. And uh, I asked the team and they just didn't, didn't see the point. And I kind of agree with them. So if I kick off the blood tech backtest mode and start, start going backwards, you will see that this is all going to, uh, to, to go as it was at the time. So here's the London average session range. It gets smashed. We have a little bit of a reversal here. And then it hits VWAP. So it's sort of like a mean, tiny little mean reversion. And... Um, and now we have different levels that renew for the New York session because we have different players and all of that. So yeah, if you can see average daily range, average session range, they all track in a backtest. 
And right now we're still the only ones with um, this sort of feature where you can manually control it rather than not having control and just the market spewing out a whole bunch of candles in the strategy tester, uh, which again is useful, but I kind of prefer to like, for example, see one of the, the um, let's say a failed auction. So you wanna test, you wanna see how the market behaved when there was a failed auction. Here's like a partial one. This one is also coming from an average session range and then goes all the way to VWAP and then finishes there. You then also want to see whether the initial balance edge was reactive or whether it went to the supply. So here you can see the sustained auction happens. Then the market goes all the way back to the supply and to VWAP, by the way. And then literally has like a limited day, which is not a trend, but it's not exactly a failed auction either. So that can tell you a lot. Here's one of the 35% trending days where the market breaks out, doesn't look back. And it actually does so uh, with the value acceptance trade. So this is the kind of trade that I was looking for today. I was looking for the market to rotate to the other side, which is all the way up here. So this was the value area from the previous day. The market accepted it and then you had these like 70 ticks all the way through to the other side of the value and that would have been the trade but obviously we can't control that we don't know whether the market is going to go all the way there or not in my experience um value acceptances are not 80 <laughs> percent at all like it depends on so many different factors however one thing that I have noticed is that you can get a 55 to 56% of the value acceptances that do work out and then you go into the can of worms. Do you have enough profit margin? Um, is the value area big enough? Um, did it happen too late in the day? Did it rotate immediately or did we kind of just stop? So all of that will um, carry a huge, um, huge role in quantifying whether your setup for the value acceptance trade is strong or not. Uh, my problem today was that I wasn't at, at the charts when this happened. So this is a value acceptance to the downside. The other one that I was just showing you is to the opposite side. So, um, so obviously this is why I bailed and uh, you need to know when to bail. Like that's actually probably more important than just going, Oh, you're hyper at very level. <laughs> Because if you don't know whether the market is gonna keep going or whether it's slowing down and you're just stubbornly holding on, that is the worst thing that you can do as a trader. So you have to have that degree of objectivity. That's the part that takes the longest. Never mind, you know, levels and stuff. You learn that in a month. All the other stuff around it, how, how do you exactly take advantage of a level that is reversing, but we have a really high volatility day. So it's like, what stop loss do I use? Do, do you know should I trade without a stop don't do that <laughs> um, one of the reasons why I say that is because it's going to be a very very long time before you start having problems with executions typically uh, the reason why you would trade without a stop it's not because you're trading without stops it's because you have an idea of when you want to scale out but you're trading with a size and in a market where your stop is not going to be respected all in one go. So what's going to happen is that uh, if I enter with the 20 lots here and there isn't enough contracts available for my full, um, for my full order to be filled all at once, it's either going to fill me like maybe scale out five contracts or two and then scale out some more and some more and all of that just it, it makes me uncomfortable because I don't have full control over it. So one of the reasons why people with um, slightly more size choose not to place a hard stop is because we can choose when we're going to scale out and then you have full control over the scale out. And same goes for targets. It doesn't mean anything for summer market to, for me to get a two hour target if the price is not going to fill me by the, by the time it reaches it. So until you get to that point, just use hard stops. There's a formula that I use as a starting point for all of my tradable products. 
it helps you to figure out whether your stop is too small or too big because neither of those are good you need to make sure that your stop loss is of, of an appropriate size that allows you to stay in the market for long enough but also to be small enough to give you a statistically viable target because anything below you know 1.5 r and you're on a slippery slope so you you need that seesaw imbalance of accuracy so aka hit rate and risk reward ratio Jerobi says do you think a fail auction long is still probable um or do you think it's too late well the problem with a failed auction is that this is now not a failed auction this is now an auction fade so as far as i'm concerned that is already over i would not go into a failed auction which is again an extended auction fade because you only have 23 ticks until you hit another area of resistance or a supply. So this is why I mark this. I want to become a seller when the price hits this area. Oh, crude oil. Okay. Well, again, there's no failed auction because we have a non-trend day. And in fact, because of how strong the downtrend is, we have three... Um, three... Uh, time frames using the supply and demand concept to tell you whether supplies or demands are in, in force and you can see that all of these four hour daily and weekly are showing down so that's why I would be more in favor of failed auction short which I also wrote here than the failed auction long where I don't really have a level because one of the reasons why I have a SIEB level here SIEB setup is because the 0 0.5 um, DR low which is here, 68, 98. And we've just tested that. So now I will be expecting this to, at the very least, go somewhere towards this high here. And everything is becoming very, very flat. So this is typical for summer trading. You can see that the settlement price from, Let me just check whether that is the correct settlement price because I didn't really check this before. Mm -hmm. It is not, it is not, it's not right. Okay, so settlement time is this one on crude oil. Um, but you can see that even with that, this is settlement has not moved from Friday Friday, Thursday settlement, and then we fell from all the way up here. And then again, we have pretty static market settlement, 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 not going anywhere, right? So that is a dead giveaway that we have summer markets in force. And that calls for a slight adjustment in your trading or a total adjustment in your trading strategies. That's why I say to you guys, you can't just be a you know, one trick pony. If you want to be an intraday trader, you have to understand all the conditions pretty deeply in order to know exactly what you're doing. And then to work within the probabilities of each level, because I know that 0.5 R, yes, it brings a, a reversal, but it only happens like the actual reversal in general from this particular level only happens about 33% of the time. So am I now looking at the 33% of the time where the level is going to be reactive and it's going to give me my some kind of profit? Or are we looking at a slowdown, momentary slowdown before the market carries on lower with the larger time frame sentiment that is clearly down? Now, chart location might save you on large time frames as well because we are coming from a demand area. Uh, however, right now I'm looking at a third test of a demand. The more times a level is tested, the quicker it's tested once the price moves away. That is um, usually a sign that the market is not done with the downside move yet. But because we're so low in this whole distribution curve on a larger time frame, I'm willing to try along for a couple of hours. So I'm not looking to hold this overnight. I'm not looking to have some kind of a major swing trade. I don't really do much swing trading these days anyway. So this is what I mean when I talk about the micro trends intraday and the larger time frame sentiment. So you can't mix apples and oranges. If you start mixing the two, you're going to get yourself very confused very quickly. I only know maybe of a couple of people who are able to do that 
successfully and neither of those are very ordinary people they're actually really extraordinary individuals that have a an incredible amount of discipline and you know all the rest of us including myself i just don't want that stress because what happens me as a performance coach i have seen people try to do swings and intraday and mixing it what happens is that when their intraday trade idea fails they then try to um to use that to turn it into a swing they say oh i'm just going to give it a draw like a bigger bigger stop loss so never mind it goes into a draw i will be correct you're not correct <laughs> your intraday trade failed like it's over right if you want a swing trade that has a whole host of other issues attached to it so until you've had super accuracy and until you've had well never mind accuracy if you've had consistent profitability for a few years with one way of doing things right then you might want to explore the possibility to separate your methodologies one into a swing condition and another bunch of or well, different setups for intraday conditions which are all a subset of a whole bunch of different things right because intraday is like trading on steroids right you are looking for extraordinarily small changes in the price to happen and you want to take advantage of those and those are not going to be the same it's not going to be the same time frame as an intraday setup um, an intraday setup might be done in 10 minutes but it might actually drag on for another three hours especially during the summertime so to give you an example of how you would separate out swing trading versus intraday let's have a look at the daily chart so we know there's a demand level around here so what you might say is that you're looking for a dedicated price action to reverse from here before you kick off a trade and then you might want to keep your swing trade going for a few days using a stop loss size that is at least two-thirds of the average true range or average daily range however you want to however you want to call it so yeah uh, Jerobi, the reason why um, why a spike down may not bring a failed auction is because it gets too late in the day for such a setup in crude oil. If you're talking ES, then um, then that might be more relevant because ES has this thing where the bond markets close and then everybody that trades uh, bonds comes over into equities and they cause this uh, additional volume and movement towards the end of the session. That doesn't happen in, in crude oil, right? So um, really you're looking at a failed auction to happen within the first three hours of the market. Um, and it's not, it doesn't look this way. <laughs> this is way too slow. Um, failed auctions are momentum trades and they as you've seen many times a true failed auction will happen early it will happen quickly and it will rotate to the other side of the first hour trading range pretty much within about an hour if it doesn't happen be very suspicious so it's either not a failed auction it's either um, maybe a potential for a neutral day um, or you might be looking at a slow sustained auction down against your failed auction long idea um, the failed auctions I prefer to always do on the days when you will have some sort of reliance on not just the open sentiment but also the overall larger time frame trend. So this is why I would choose an, a failed auction short over a failed auction long today. Because the failed auction long, even if we go down, there's nothing here like it would be like up in, in up in arms like we have uh, areas lower down but then that wouldn't be a failed auction that would again be a very regular auction fade which again has different entry points different targets entirely different setup and uh, and if you're looking for a swing trade well yeah this might be a good area for a swing trade um, and then what would be your target for a swing trade? Well, you have to look at where your resistances are. So let's use, let's use 150 tick stop just for, uh, for reference. Um, you do have a supply area here, but you do have another area. So this swing trade would not have enough profit margin for me. Therefore, I would probably be looking for 
a lower area from a lower time frame so not daily but let's have a look at a four hour chart so we have some reactions from this area so if i go for the overlap uh, mode on the blatic supply and demand uh, that will show up but i can see it even without it because i don't need an indicator to see my levels um, so from that point of view, you would be looking at a swing trade that does have enough profit margin because here you have 3R, nothing really much in the way to 3R. Um, and I can argue that this is already gone because we've already had that. So that would be the swing trade. But you wouldn't be able to now start a swing trade here and then go... Oh, well, I'm just going to keep it because you don't have the profit margin suddenly. The conditions are not there. Your chart location is gone and you're getting involved in the middle of the swing. Is that like quite possibly the worst thing you can do for a swing trade or for any trade, really? <laughs> Maybe if you're looking for a breakout momentum trade, um, you can sort of rely on the momentum to save you from a poor choice of a trade location. But um, again, not something that that's going to work for you long term. <laughs> And we are aiming for long term here. We're not aiming to be making a lot of money this week and then losing a whole bunch of money next week. That is not what the market stalkers is all about. We are looking for longevity. We're looking for levels that work time and time again, even several times a day. We're looking for setups that we can take advantage of throughout the year, not just have like, oh yeah, momentum trading happens 35% of the time. So therefore I'm going to sit on my ass and do absolutely fuck all for the others, like 70% of the year. That's not what we want, right? And yet a lot of people teach you these different uh, strategies that are relying on momentum trading. You guys know, I've showed you some statistics. Crude oil, for example, only trends properly 35% of the time. 35. The rest of it is ranging days, limited auction days, failed auctions. So we, we must learn how to tackle those. You have to learn how to navigate the ranging days a lot more than doing momentum trading. Anyone can make money when everything's moving. This is why everybody got suckered in during COVID because everybody's like, oh yeah, I've made like, uh, you know, 30 grand on crypto. Yeah, because it was moving. It's really not rocket science. And now I have some people who have traded then and they're like, oh yeah, I really want to go into trading, but it like seems a lot more difficult now. It's like, yeah, really? <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> and I warned everybody against that. I was like, look, we're in a black swan event. This doesn't happen every day. This is not how the markets work. You will never make long-term money doing what you've done during COVID. And the problem with momentum, I've spoken about this so many times, the momentum seduces you into thinking that your setups are awesome. They're not. The true test of a method or an approach will only become fully robust if you can keep it going through all sorts of markets. When it's quiet, when it's the summer, when it's January, post Christmas, and you know, only then will you have longevity and only then can you say, okay, I'm a real trader now. I can make this work for many years to come because I'm experienced enough. Until you get to that point, you're just a novice. And I was a novice like probably for nine years and I've been trading for 15 years, but it wasn't really until the year nine that I kind of thought to myself, okay, this is, uh, I'm pretty confident, like I, behind every single setup that I do, I can rationalize it to the point that I combine the market generated information, I combine the levels uh, and price action behavior around the levels, and then I can confidently say, right, now I know what I'm looking for. And I also know when the setup is gonna fail. So there's no reaction, and I've sat in a trade for like three hours, and the market is sitting below my entry point for a long trade, for example, it means the trade is not gonna work out. And I can also tell you whether the trade is gonna work out pretty quickly uh, when I'm looking at a momentum trade. So if I don't get that higher high or lower low very quickly, already in the first two minutes after I got involved and the market is still sitting at my entry price, I will bail. Because you don't want to sit in trades that are in a, in a drawdown, especially not in a momentum trade. Like you're looking for a momentum trade. If there's no momentum in, in your direction, you're wrong. 
get out. <laughs> Put the ego aside and get the fuck out of there, right? So yeah, we must use the, all of the available data and formulate the hypos that speak to the market narrative as best as possible. And keep doing that day in, day out, a year on, you will have a pretty solid methodology behind your hands and uh, be on your hands. And you will also uh, be able to go back in time and go, oh, I was really crap with momentum trading before, or I was really shit with range trading. But now that I've seen this thing happen over and over because I'm using a systematic framework, oh, I can imp improve this. Like, for example, one very good way of looking at this is to have a look at your MAE and MFE numbers. That's maximum adverse excursion, which basically tells you in a, in a very simple way, how much drawdown does your trade suffer while it's alive before going to, 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 before you take it off in profit or whatever, right? Obviously, if you go to stop loss, MAE will not be measured because the trade just got stopped out. But MFE is the opposite. How much profit do you actually get before the market turns around? And for that measure, I'm pretty sure they uh, consider the losses as well. And then if you are constantly aiming for 3R, but none of your trades, your MAE says that you will only get maximum 1.5R, you then have two options, either reduce your target to 1.5R or adjust your stop loss size so that the 1.5R actually becomes 2R. So instead of using 40 tick stops, use 20 tick stops. That's how you optimize a trading system. You don't optimize it by sitting there cl clicking random buttons and going, well, I hope it works out someday. <laughs> it's data science, it's data analytics, and it's, it's endlessly entertaining and intellectually stimulating for me. But obviously I can recognize how for some people it's extraordinarily dull, dull and you, know, you don't wanna sit there um, crunching numbers all day. But it, it, at its core, that's what trading is. Like, I'm sorry to break it to you. It's not super exciting. A, a big, big part of being a trader is looking at your numbers, being super critical about yourself and seeing how you can exploit the edge that you might have uh, might have noticed in the stats. Because you obviously can use that to, to get better. And nobody can replace you um, doing that. So you can't take my numbers and then just go, well, I'm just going to take these MAE because I may have different entries completely, different MAE, different MFE, and I've optimized my system and my way of trading to be able to take advantage of smaller uh, trades that do hit 1R and 1.3R, and I'm still profitable, but I do have, again, 69, 70% accuracy, which has held up for the last six months or so, maybe even longer, I haven't looked that far back. But that is how you do it. So if you're not willing to do it, maybe trading isn't for you. Like, I'm sorry to break it to you, you know? Padawan, you have Edgewonk. Um, so Edgewonk pretty much does everything for you. <laughs> um, but you do have to import your trades. And there is um, a highest and lowest uh, number or price in the advanced trader stats. So even though I import my trades at the end of the day, I still like to go put a screenshot down, especially if I've done something that I'm not uh, particularly happy with that day. And you will always have something to work on. Okay, so let me just break this myth uh, right now. Just because you're a successful trader, it doesn't mean that self-development stops. You always have to keep track of what you're doing. And if you notice that any part of your, your approach is slipping, you need to bring it right back, okay? Otherwise, bad habits can mount really fucking quickly. And then you're in trouble. Then you haven't made money for like six months and you're thinking, oh, what happened there? What happened is that you malfunctioned. That's what happened. And that can happen to everybody. So for me, it's all about not necessarily eliminating your weaknesses, but definitely minimizing them as much as possible so that the Muppet moments only happen every so often and that they don't actually hurt your performance overall. You can screw it up one day, but then the next day you have to go, right, I traded too much yesterday. That needs to change like tomorrow. Like I can't, I can't do it. I can't keep doing it like that because I know it's going to hurt me. So you have to let go of the ego. Being right is not always uh, the, the best thing for, for a trader. 
And if you become a good loser, that will serve you very well. So admitting that you're not right, admitting that the trade might fail, getting out early instead of letting it fall, hit full stop loss, because that's not necessary either. There are signs that your, your trade won't work. Like for example, right now, if I didn't have this little bullish engulfing here, even though there's a selling wick, you know, that's all just range bound trading. But if this was still set inside this drawdown with nothing to show for, for like no profit whatsoever, I would be bailing out of it from minus 0 0.3, 0 0.5, as long as I, you know, as I notice that the price action is not doing what I expect it to do. But right now we are turning around. So at the moment, my trade has gone into some profit and in fact, it almost reached one hour. But this is not the type of trade that I'm aiming for today. I'm actually aiming for a little bit higher than that. So we'll see whether that works. But again, if it doesn't work in another hour and a half and it's still, um, it's still, it's still alive, I'm still not going to keep it in some vague hope that it might work out by the end of the day. Because I wanted it to work out within a two hour period that I'm trading, not four hours time. <laughs> And that's also where the intraday trading should differ. You need to have a time expectation of how long do you want to keep this for? It's not swing trading. And really the best, uh, the best time is about 10 minutes up to about 45 minutes. So most of my good trades are already in profit by about 30 to 45 minutes time. Anything past that and I'm either in a very slow day or the trade is just not going to work out. I got the wrong side. And that's fine. That's okay. So you need to be okay with that. Ocean says, uh, let's go the ego. <laughs> let's go the ego. Really? What, what commercial was that? Because I, I didn't grow up in, in the UK, USA. I grew up in Serbia. So although we had satellite, um, I don't remember that commercial. Padawan says, I need to hear this every day. I think a lot of people should hear this every day, to be honest. <laughs> you know, you come on a live stream and somebody just tells you not to do stupid shit. It might help you for the day, yeah. So was ego some kind of a, a waffle? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's definitely America. <laughs> I don't think I ever ate breakfast either as a, as a child. I don't do now either, but uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't think I would have been that interested in commercials that are advertising carbs. Ego, ego, okay, let go of your ego. Maybe we can uh, do a, um, another recreate, like recreate the commercial. <laughs> Have Rod come and, and join me. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's have a look at what's going on with gold now. Has it reached that area that I was talking about? Result is a negative. So I'm still waiting. This looks like it's going to be a play maybe for after um, after lunchtime in New York. So we've got a little bit of time to wait for that. There is also a strong possibility that now, since we've uh, not really extended the market all the way down, that this actually turns into a neutral day. So what is a neutral day for those of you who are new here? Neutral day is when you have the first hour trading range, which is marked in this red box. Um, when that first hour of the trading range is extended to both sides. That is not like 89% of the time a neutral day of that sort will mean that there is no further chance of market going higher. So obviously you are working with a high probability event, but there is, you know, 10 or 11% where the market can keep going. But for the most part, neutral day is 90% chance that the price migrates back to the middle. So that's something that you can use. That's a market behavior and an observation by which you can formulate your strategy. And there's another way to, to get into that 
today is not exactly the right time for that so i'm not going to go into that strategy uh, but just know that there are things that you can do to bump up your trading skills based on the information that you already have now for me i am looking for a supply to potentially bring me a sell so not a neutral day but a setup that relies on these sellers that happened pretty early in the session that brought the value acceptance from the beginning of the stream that I was talking about. And then for the volume to be not that great for that time of day, so therefore to not have enough power behind it to break through that area. So those are very, very specific times and very specific setup that you can use towards the end of the session to to get like another opportunistic trade. And then again, opportunistic trades versus proper big reversals. That's another subject for maybe another day. Like so many things to talk about. So many different, well, not, not like a million things, but you can categorize all of these setups probably in about four different categories, let's say. So you have momentum trading. Again, it doesn't happen that often. Um, you can look forward to the 32 up to 42% of trending days when you're looking at a sample size of a couple of years. But again, that sort of relationships re relationship rings true even when you go further back, regardless of whether it's a black swan or not. And then you have range bound days. Now range bound days can have a neutral day, but they can also have something like this where the top of the first hour trading range stays fresh and virginal, untouched. Um, but then you have the market that extends the other way. However, it doesn't go too far. So now you have a range and this is why the top of the range becomes my zone of interest, but only for particular parts of the session. Then you can have um days of trading inside the actual initial balance so non-trend day like i have here on crude oil and that's moving nicely so we are going over one r there now if i can get 1.5 r out of this i'll be perfectly happy with that because again i have 69 to 70 percent accuracy at the moment you get 1.5 r in most of your trades or even just a portion of your trades that is a profitable smashing system so if you haven't seen my risk of ruin video if you're new here you may want to check that out so go to my channel it's in one of the long form videos um, very very useful metric you would be taking your hit rate your position sizing uh, your average risk reward and seeing how that would work out and with what sort of risk of drawdown and risk of ruin over thousands of trades like it's, and it's a very simple calculator, right? It's not a spreadsheet, it's not an indicator. It's on my FX book. I don't trade Forex, but they do have some tools that are pretty useful across the board. And hit rate and average risk reward, that's universal for any sort of style of trading. Right, I'm going to keep an eye on that now. Um, I also want to say just because I trade 20 lots on my um, account, that doesn't mean that you should as well. I actually have prop accounts from Apex where I'm still trading one or two lots. So it depends on how long you've been doing it, the size of your account and um, what chapter of your trading you're at so you know you can't just start trading and then three months later you're doing like 20 and 40 lots because you will get lost it's too much too soon but if you're looking for longevity and consistency start with one lot start with one contract even micro contract get consistency there move away from monetary values whether somebody's trading 20 contracts or one contract that doesn't change the relationship of the levels and the market generated information that you're looking for. We all still use the same levels. The difference is that I have to scale out for the summer. Sometimes I don't have to scale out. If there's a lot of liquidity, I look at the dome and I can see that there's like a, a lot of contracts available. I can't just hit close the trade and it, it does it all in one go. But it's just rare for crude oil and gold. 
um, something that's a thicker market like ES. You can trade 80 lots like during COVID. I had no problems opening and closing trades, nothing. Obviously, um, we're not in a black swan event anymore. So the number of uh, available units per price has come down and I'm not really trading ES for the summertime because I bloody hate when it goes absolutely nowhere for a lot of the days and then it has one day when it trends. So I don't like ES for that reason. I try to stick to my commodities. That's where I'm the strongest. It's my bread and butter. So if you want equities, um, I can tell you the, the you know, how, what's worked for me. I just don't like it as a daily addition to my tradable assets. Ocean, uh, I'm not going to jinx anything. The only thing that you can jinx is uh, your own trading skills. So just do better. <laughs> Go back to your trading journal. You know what I'm going to say. You're here every day. <laughs> so <laughs> you know how it works by now. All right, guys, I think I'm going to wind it down now again a little bit earlier than usual. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, for those of you who have joined me for the first time, uh, do check out some of the free look live streams that I've had before uh, and consider checking out the main website. All the links are down below. In the meantime, let's try to be less muppety and more market stalkery with every passing day. Enjoy. <laughs>